and members. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting of the State Government Finance and Election Committee to order uh, pursuant to rule House, uh, House Rule 10.01. Uh, today is January 19th, 2021. And the committee legislative assistant will uh, take the roll. Uh, Chair Nelson? Here. Vice Chair Carlson? Present. Representative Nash? Present. Representative Bonner? Present. Representative Dreskowski? Representative Elkins? Present. Representative Greenman? Present. Representative Cleborn? Cleborn present. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick present. Representative Mason? Present. Representative New Brindley? Representative Pulowski? Present. Uh, a quorum is present. And make note that Representative Quam checked in. He has the, a bill up in capital investments. Great. Um, next order business approval of the minutes for uh, January 14th, 19, uh, 2021. Um, Representative Cleavorn, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, Chair Nelson, I move the minutes be adopted as written. Motion is made to approve the minutes as written. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes have been passed. Uh, members, uh, the rules for the committee have been emailed to you and they were posted on the committee website. Um, we do not need to vote on these, but uh, um, they're here before the committee. If, uh, like I said, we're hopefully we can adhere to these. And I said the 24 hour rule and that on the amendments um, as much as possible so that we can get them posted for the public. But uh, we can have we we you know we can move on and be flexible if, if we have to in the future. Um, and with that, uh, I want to welcome uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison to the committee. Good morning, Attorney General. And, Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, you have a presentation of uh, a combination of an overview, a slight overview, and and your budget recommendations. That's right. And um, I will begin with a budget overview. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking right, Member Nash and all members for having me here. I'd like to also share with you, I have with me today, uh, Mr. Ray Smith, who is the head of our finance group and Eric Miller, who is the head of our, e our um, electronic um, law group who handles mostly discovery issues, but given the vast uh, amount of documents we have to process, we really rely on his services. He's available and can respond to questions uh, as they arise. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me. We, the Attorney General's office and all 325 members uh, of that office definitely appreciate this committee's time. Um, just an overview about the Attorney General, the Minnesota Constitution established the Office of Attorney General to serve as the state's chief legal officer. Uh, every state has an Attorney General, 43 states, including Minnesota, have elected uh, attorneys general in 48 states have attorneys general that uh, um, serve the people uh, and have uh, what they call common law parents patriot authority to take legal action on behalf of the state. Only two states mirror the federal system where the chief executive appoints the attorney general. Uh, the states have opted to have an, a, a, a split executive, if you will, and uh, the Attorney General in Minnesota and 43 other states operates on the, uh, at the pleasure of the voter. Uh, the role of the, and duties of the Attorney General arise from the Minnesota Constitution, state statutes, cases, uh, particularly chapter eight uh, defines the, uh, the Attorney General's duties and responsibilities. Um, the Attorney General has three main duties and several other important ancillary duties uh, those ancillary duties include the Board of Pardons, State Board of Investment, the Executive Council, and a few others. But the main part of the work I do every day and our office does every day is to represent the state agencies, boards, and commissions. There are over 100 of them. It's our job to represent them. The, our relationship 
to them is attorney client. They make the decisions. We do the legal work. Uh, uh, the second main duty of the attorney general's office is to protect the people of the state of Minnesota by bringing lawsuits on behalf of Minnesota residents as the chief enforcer of the state's consumer protection, antitrust and charities laws in Minnesota statute section 8.31, the legislature directed the attorney general to investigate and prosecute violations of law of this state respecting unfair discriminatory or other unlawful practices in business, commerce, or trade. That's uh, Minnesota section 8.31. Three, the third main thing we do, and the bulk of my time is spent um, supporting uh, county attorneys, local authorities, especially from, um, from smaller counties uh, in criminal uh, justice uh, related matters. We, um, uh, there's of the 87 counties in Minnesota, I'd say about 79 of them to 80 of them uh, would call us if they had a murder or a serious crime. Uh, we, in, in, we consider that support role very critical. The attorney general cannot initiate a criminal prosecution on its own. We have to be brought in by the county attorneys or appointed by the governor, but it's uh, common that we get called upon in, in district court matters and in appellate ones as well. Let me share with you a little bit about how the Attorney General's office is organized. The Attorney General uh, currently is made of about 325 hardworking employees. About 40% of them are lawyers. The remainder are legal assistants, including investigators, consumer assistance group, mediators, financial analysts, uh, economists, one or two economists, and uh, support staff. The office consists of four large legal sections. Four different sections were divided into. Uh, each one is led by a deputy attorney general or the solicitor. There's only one solicitor, so three deputies and the solicitor who's equivalent to a deputy. The first one is consumer protection. It's led by James Canada, extremely able leader. Health and safety. Uh, that is uh, led by um, David uh, Voigt who is, uh, is a very strong deputy government support by Luz Maria Frias and the Solicitor General, uh, Liz Kramer. Each section has divisions underneath it, organized around subject matter and client agencies. Because we have limited time today, I won't go into the further organization of the office, but I'm happy to refer you to our annual report as required under Minnesota Statute 8.15, uh, and that's filed in the Legislative Reference Library and it outlines much of the work we've done over the past year. I'm proud of the report and I encourage you to read it. Let me talk to you about what the Attorney General's office brings to the state of Minnesota and the people of Minnesota. <clears throat> uh, we bring a lot of things, including uh, monetary value. Usually the office is a net contributor to the state. <clears throat> In recent years, the office has saved the state or return to state coffers millions of dollars. In 2018 alone, six large settlements brought in over $100 million to the state of Minnesota. So far in fiscal year 21, we've deposited about 5 million into the state's general fund. The Office of Attorney General also puts dollars directly back into the pockets of your constituents, including people and businesses. Last year, our Consumer Action Division obtained over $5 million in uh, for Minnesota consumers. That's businesses and people. These are your constituents and they often, very often, uh, they've been preyed upon by fraudsters. It's our job to protect them from those fraudsters and uh, our folks do a good job. Um, let me talk to you about budget. Um, for three biennia before the current one, the total general fund appropriation for the Attorney General's office was frozen at 2.2.125 million. The general fund appropriation to the attorney general's office in 2018 was the same as what it was in 2004 and 20% lower than what it was in 2002. And so for the current biennium beginning in July 1, 2019, the attorney general's office received its first real dollar increase in six years, bringing our general fund appropriation to 23.513 million, uh, 23 and a half million dollars. Here's what we spend our money on. It's very straightforward. 
more than 80% of our appropriations go to salary and benefits that support our employees with the rest going toward administrative expenses. We do have change items we would like to put in front of you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members, <clears throat> I'd now like to draw attention to your uh, to our change item uh, requests uh, and uh, for your consideration. Therefore, and I'll share them with you. The first one is investments in technology. Uh, all of our investment, all of our change item requests are urgent. This one is the most urgent. Investments in recruitment and retention. Uh, I'll explain that more. We've got to have a top staff to meet the needs of the people of the state of Minnesota. Investments in antitrust. This is meeting the changing market and the high concentration of nearly every American uh, economic uh, industry and the need for greater competition. And um, that is something that it's, we are charged to do, but we're under, underfunded to do. Uh, investments in criminal enforcement. As I noted earlier, we definitely need to be there for uh, all of the smaller counties in our state, which is the greater majority, about more than 79 of them. Let me begin talking about investments in technology. Uh, I'm not an expert, Eric Miller is, and he's here uh, for your questions. But first, let me just go over a few things. First, the Attorney General's Office requests resources to make investments in technology that are critical to running a modern law office. When I started practicing law, you could just type up your uh, papers, go down, have them stamped at the court office and file them. Um, nowadays, e-filing is how ordinary business is done. The change item for investments in technology has four parts. First, expanding e-discovery. So when we're suing, for example, uh, Purdue, uh, Purdue or the Sacklers or, or, any, or anybody, any huge company, uh, we often will get tons of documents, nearly impossible just to catalog and know every single document, every single thing in there. E-discovery allows us to, to manage that large database. The uh, other part of the um, technology request is purchase of a centralized case management system. Uh, an up, third update to our consumer complaint database. We get complaints from all over the state. We need to be able to we did disaggregate the data. We also need to be able to use that data to, to trend spot. And then um, lastly, but certainly just as important as the other ones, is to develop an online charity registration da database. We already have one. It's deeply antiquated. Let me turn now to e-discovery. The, the Attorney General currently uses electronic discovery or e-discovery software to manage ever expanding a number of electronic documents uh, that are the center of complex litigation that the Attorney General handles on behalf of the state agencies and people of the state. The Attorney General currently has more than 60 matters that have more than 50,000 documents. I didn't say 50,000 pages, 50,000 separate documents, some of which are quite voluminous individually. With the largest case, having about 5.9 million documents. Um, these, uh, these, <clears throat> these tools, um, and that should say pages, these tools help uh, our staff uh, search, organize, and locate key documents that help prove our case and allow us to defend lawsuits against state agencies. E-discovery tools allow the Attorney General to take on cases that we may not otherwise be able to. E-discovery technology is essential in the successful resolution uh, for Minnesota consumers, for cases against CenturyLink, Comcast, Instance Therapeutics. You know, that's a, that's a, um, a uh, case involving um, um, antitrust violations uh, involving um, insulin. Um, the Minnesota School of Business, Globe University, big, vo big volume documentation, uh, and it's also proven essential in our Medicaid Fraud Control Unit that recovers costs for the state. That unit uh, is, is essential to making sure that the Medicaid program is viewed as a good program, a program of integrity. Our lawyers take people to task who abuse that program, and so, but we need to be able to operate the program uh, with of the best with, with available technology. E-discovery tools are not available to state agencies through minute. So the state agencies represent 
uh, either uh, we represent either rely on the uh, attorney general or outside vendors to do it. We have resisted charging state agency, agency clients for the cost of hosting their data and the staff uh, costs involved. But there, are, there have been and there are explosive growth in data being sent to the uh, AGL. And uh, that has led to explosive costs. And the AGL has borne that for the state agencies. Uh, we need some help with this. Next, let me talk about our, uh, as part of our upgraded technology requests, where our improvements to our case management system, including cloud backup and disaster recovery. After years of underinvestment, the office's internally built case management system is simply antiquated. It does not provide the functionality we need to efficiently manage and report on the thousands of documents that are open at any given time. As I said, the volume of data we manage also continues to grow exponentially. Our intention is to purchase a case management system that is specifically designed for managing the approximately 2,500 legal matters initiated each year. We also intend to shift to cloud-based storage that will allow us to house tens of millions of documents we manage across cases and maintain appropriate backup and disaster recovery in the event of a failure or other catastrophic events. Additionally, as part of our needed IT upgrades includes the charities database. This is particularly important. Minnesota law mandates that the Minnesota Attorney General's Office maintain a registry of soliciting charitable organizations, professional fundraisers, and charitable trusts that meet certain statutory requirements. There are currently more than 13,000 soliciting charitable organizations, nearly 3,000 charitable trusts, and more than 400 professional fundraisers with, with registered with our office. The current system was implemented over 20 years ago, two decades. It's not paper, it is a paper-based system. Uh, it's a paper-based system and registrants must complete a paper, uh, a mail paper registration documents and checks to our office. Staff must then manually input the data into the database, which now has a significant number of bugs and errors. Some of these errors impact the ability of our office to fulfill its statutory duty. A new online charity registration system will not only improve our ability to fulfill those duties and prevent uh, and enforcement and violations of charities law, it'll provide the public with more transparency about how charities in Minnesota raise and spend money that Minnesotans contribute. The last item on our IT request is an updated consumer complaint system Consumer Action Division directly assists consumers, businesses, and other organizations in obtaining settlements with third parties. Through its efforts, the division often eliminates the need for costly, time-consuming litigation. Uh, it also helps uh, consumers informally resolve complaints with businesses. The division received more than 17,000 complaints, but we got more than 85,000 calls last year. 17,000 actual actionable complaints, but a lot of call volume. And we saved or returned more than $5 million directly to the public. So that is an important value. Like the charities database, the consumer complaint database is implemented over 20 years ago. The database holds a few hundred thousand complaints, originally a paper-based database. It, has, it is slightly modified last year to allow for online submissions. Uh, however, the online form is not linked to the database. Complaints submitted online must be entered by hand. The, a new consumer uh, complaints database will allow staff to serve Minnesotans far more efficiently and more quickly. We also propose to change the technology underlying the database to allow people to track status of their own complaints, which they cannot do now. It will also allow us to identify trends in the, data, in the complaint data which often serve as a basis for investigations that protect Minnesotans from fraud and abuse. Again, those are the four parts of our first overall change request for investments in technology. Joining me today again is Eric Miller, manager of our e-discovery unit, and he's available to answer any detailed questions you may have about this request. As I noted, I'm not the expert, Eric is, and um, feel free to ask him questions at the right time.
The next item I'd like, change item I'd like to address is recruitment and retention. Our second of four change items is for recruitment and retention of attorneys and support staff. The Attorney General's Office is the law office for the people of the state of Minnesota. Few law offices in Minnesota handle the range and complexity of civil litigation as the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. Our clients include more than 100 state agencies, boards and commissions, as well as the people of the state of Minnesota. We handle more than 7,000 legal files every year. Recruiting and retaining an expert workforce is not only essential for the AGO to fulfill its duty to the, to the state and serve and protect Minnesotans, but it is also cost efficient. If the state contracted out for the same services as the AGO provides, the cost would be enormous, way more than you spend now, and the quality would not be nearly as good. Our lawyers, when they're allowed to stick around for a while, when they're able to stay in the office because they're being compensated fairly, develop expertise and institutional memory, and it helps them become good at what they do. I talked about the impact of long-term disinvestment in AGO and technology. Another significant impact is that our attorneys earn less than public attorneys for, metro, uh, for local metro counties and almost a third less than the U.S. Attorney's Office. This gap in earnings can make it very challenging for us to recruit public interest-minded lawyers. And when we are able to recruit, recruit them, the gap can make it hard to retain them. Sometimes our attorneys leave us for these other public law offices because they can earn more money for their families there and still serve the public. When they do, their knowledge and expertise leaves with them. And that hurts the people of the state of Minnesota. And I'm talking about Ramsey County, Hennepin County, other public law offices, great people who do great work. But our folks should not be, our, the AGO should not be a training ground for those in agencies. We should compensate our people fairly. And I ask you to help me do this. The small increase we seek this year is the difference between our original request to the legislature in 2019 and what were being appropriated during the 2019 special session. So it's really not a brand new thing. It's just trying to make up for what we project as our needs from the last biennium. Fine, and let me just talk about antitrust enforcement. Our third uh, of the four change items is investment in antitrust enforcement to protect competition in our state. Antitrust laws are a critical piece of Minnesota's consumer protection framework. Antitrust laws are designed to protect competition, allowing the marketplace to deliver superior goods and services to consumers at a higher quality and a lower price than the market would without competition. <clears throat> competition also provides an incentive to businesses to be more efficient, to have better customer service, which helps them to survive. Efficiency helps businesses survive in a transnational economy. But when there is no competition, that incentive isn't there. That's when we come in to enforce the antitrust laws. It's not fair to the vast majority of Minnesota businesses who play by the rules to be undercut by illegal anti-competitive uh, antitrust behavior by a few, often very large bad actors, and it also harms Minnesota consumers. The Attorney General's Office has actively investigated or brought litigation against antitrust behavior in two areas. One is the pharmaceutical industry, including the prices of generic drugs and insulin. The other is in agriculture, where we continue to focus on issues of importance to farmers and rural communities. Although I cannot reveal the details of our investigations, they involve aspects of livestock industry and other agricultural products of importance to Minnesota. In certain where practices of some corporate actors are hurting our farmers and diminishing and shrinking the size of the small farm community. Let me note that in 2017, since 2017, we've lost about 810 dairy farms in Minnesota. That's because large uh, actors in the, in the field uh, you know, engaging in uh, anti-competitive pricing and forcing smaller operators to, to sell or to go out of business. This is a shame. Antitrust law enforcement helps us maintain levels of competition as well as family farms and small businesses. Funding this request will not only increase capacity of the office to protect consumers and meet its duty to enforce Minnesota antitrust laws, it would have an impact on recovery of damages and civil penalties by the state. Lastly, let me go to criminal uh, enforcement. 
This is, uh, again, something we've been talking about all along. Uh, the last of our four uh, change requests is for investment in criminal enforcement by helping greater Minnesota County attorneys prosecute criminal behavior and other crimes that unfairly harm consumers and businesses. Under Minnesota, in the, under Minnesota statute 8.01, a county attorney may request the attorney general to prosecute a case for it. We, we, we try to never turn them down. And if we do, it's only because of capacity. Uh, I hate to have to say we would help you, but we don't have the people. Uh, but that has happened. Under previous administrations, the AGO significantly reduced legal services available to respond to these requests. Due to this reduction, the AGO has not had the capacity to fully lend support in prosecuting violent and complex crimes. High impact white collar crimes or cross country crimes such as sex trafficking and financial exploitation. With additional resources, we will gradually rebuild the office's capacity to aid counties to enforce the criminal laws in their jurisdiction that are beyond the scope of normal resources and aid enforcement of the criminal laws of the state. In addition, we will build a capacity to prosecute crimes that hurt Minnesotans economic security. More resources will also allow our people to provide county attorneys with more help with appeals. I'm pleased to inform you in your packets and you will, you will find a better letter, you will find a letter of support uh, of our budget request from Bob Small who is the executive director of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. And just to let you know, all without really any insistence of, I mean, without any changes in our budget um, for this particular unit, we have increased um, uh, the number of uh, criminal prosecutors in our office on our own because we see it as an urgent need, but th that has come at the expense of, of other things. Uh, we just feel we had to do it, but with a little less, uh, extra assistance we could really meet the needs of the state. So let me close by saying thank you for your time and attention. Again, I'm joined by Ray Smith, who is also available to answer questions as well as Eric Miller. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General. Um, I also just <clears throat> make note here that Representative Drzkowski and Representative New Brindley have joined us. Um, and uh, I have questions here. And if you want to have want to ask a question, raise, click on the raise your hand function on the in the Zoom. Uh, the first person I have on my list is is Representative Claiborne. Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Attorney General Ellison. My question to you is: Is there anything that you can publicly share with us about the status of the opioid litigation? and how much you estimate uh, revenue would be returned to our state from that uh, work, important work that you're doing. Attorney General. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you for asking that representative, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, uh, I we have um, had, uh, there are some things I can share. Right now, the, uh, the case involving the, uh, the Sackler uh, family in the in Purdue Pharma has been um, has been stayed because of the bankruptcy. That bankruptcy uh, uh, has has made that has put us in a position where ye, we are still trying to go negotiate settlement, but we continue to be um, we continue to be in a state in a form of stasis because of the bankruptcy. Um, you know, uh, you know, our, our litigation against Purdue Pharma uh, is, is, however, ongoing, and we continue to try to resolve that case. Um, you know, no plan has been reached so far. We don't have a settlement, so I can't speculate as to the dollar amount. Uh, settlement negotiations are ongoing with other companies, though. It's not only the Sacklers, including the opioid manufacturers and distributors. Uh, in fact, four companies, Johnson & Johnson, McKesson, Cardinal, and Amerisource Bergen have agreed in principle to a $26 billion settlement with states and local governments. While Minnesota's share is not yet clear, is not yet known, I suspect it'll be between somewhere between one to 2%. Um, we are hopeful that Minnesota will recover tens of, of and, and possibly hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. Again, not sure what that amount is gonna be, <clears throat> but, uh, I expect it to be very substantial. We intend that every dollar recovered by the state go into the opioid epidemic response account to be used for purposes of abatement, 
of opioid crisis statewide. Uh, and I would stress the last point that unlike typical litigation recoveries, uh, you know, the law that the legislature passed uh, requires that monies from opioid litigation and settlement go directly to opioid epidemic response. And that's because the important work the legislature did uh, to make sure that families and communities uh, have their problems addressed as a result of the opioid crisis. Thank you. Representative Cleveland, follow up. I see you're shaking your head. Representative Carlson, it's the next on my list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Attorney General Ellison, thank you for being with us today. Uh, appreciate your opening remarks. Uh, your agency clearly punches above its weight when it comes to the workload that you guys have uh, upon you, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, working with the um, governor's executive orders. Um, in light of all these new challenges that your agency is, is tasked with, can you... Um, Maybe just summarize for us once again, kind of uh, put in perspective, um, approximately how many of these lawsuits challenging the governor's executive orders uh, you have to defend? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Yeah. Chairman and Representative Carlson, let me just start by saying that there are over 10, there are over 10,000 restaurants and 1,500 bars in Minnesota. Overwhelmingly, they have complied with <clears throat> the COVID uh, restrictions. We have had to field questions and be in conversation with about 900 institutions, but we've only had to sue about 12. We don't just go straight to lawsuit. What we do is we, we talk with people, we negotiate, we share with information with them. We, we try to make it clear with them. We listen to them about what they, the problems that they're facing are. We, we put the, and because we, we share those back with the people who draft the, the uh, executive orders, but when you have open defiance and people saying they're just not going to abide by the law, we have had to go to court uh, and we haven't lost a single case yet. But let me be clear about how litigation works. The attorney general's office has no authority to fine anyone or punish anyone. What we can do is bring a case and the court makes the decision about whether or not there's sufficient factual basis that this entity violated the law and the executive order is the law. And then the courts will assess fines, do uh, and engage, you know, order disgorgement, um, and will, uh, in some cases, order attorney's fees. But this is after a lot of conversation, a lot of, and, and, and so it's something that we don't like to do. Uh, and we tell them that we would rather have voluntary compliance. Uh, and, th and thankfully, overwhelmingly, Minnesota uh, institutions have put their employees and their, uh, customers first and done the best they could, even despite the difficult situation everyone's in. Thank you, Attorney General, appreciate it. Uh, Representative Thank Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Attorney General, thank you for the briefing you gave me the, the other day. And I will thank ask you, you the, I will ask you the same question that I asked you then. Um, what are the fixed dollar amounts that you're asking? What is the percentage of budget increase? And then the question that I asked you the other day that I think the people who are watching this committee will, will find value in is um, many people around the state right now are experiencing a constriction of their budget. Uh, businesses are closing through no fault of their own. Families are experiencing financial distress. Uh, folks are tightening their belt around the state, and uh, I'm just wondering, what is your plan to uh, do the job with a base budget or perhaps less? Because depending on what our, uh, our fiscal forecast is going to look like, we're going to all have to tighten our belt. And I certainly understand the uh, technology requests and, and look forward to your technologist sharing some of what that is. But first question is... Um, how are you going to do more with less? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Nash, you know, one of the interesting things about our office is that when people are in economic distress, um, that we get more calls. Uh, we're counter cyclical in that way. Uh, for example, um, we've had to enforce the eviction moratorium. You can hardly shelter in place if you have no shelter. And so, you know, when, when folks have been faced with being thrown into the street. Uh, it's been our 
legal obligation to uh, call and inform landlords that they really can't do that, except for under certain, certain conditions. But you see, my point is, at, we're, we are a counter cyclical operation. So when people are being defrauded, I mean, I, I would simply submit to the committee that when people are being defrauded, when people are being a victim, when people are being the victims of wage theft, cutting the people whose job it is to protect them in that moment is, is eating your seed corn. It's, 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 it's uh, and, and I would submit that, uh, I would ask to, to respectfully ask the committee to con consider that. Um, cutting off the resources that help people when they're in most economic peril uh, leaves them in even greater economic peril. So to prevent the hardship, there's got to be a, a strong AG presence to, to, to keep people afloat. With that, uh, Representative Nash, uh, I will, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll ask uh, for a little help from my friend Ray Smith, who's head of uh, finance. And Mr. Chair, before we uh, cut yes. away to the, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we cut away, uh, Attorney General Olson, could you answer the first part of the question as to what is the monetary value and uh, growth percentage ask for your budget before we move on to the tech piece? Well, uh, actually, Representative Nash, the, uh, Mr. Ray Smith is my finance director, and I told him that I would like him to join to help with just those kind of questions. So um, if it's if it's okay with you, uh, Representative uh, Mr. Smith? Uh, Mr. Smith, if you want to state your name for the record and then proceed with or proceed to answer the question. Thank you, Attorney Nelson. Ray Smith, Director of Finance at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. Representative Nash, um, I'll start with the two change items that the committee has, has seen before in the, in the prior biennium. The assistance to rural county attorneys is a request for $1.8 million, which represents uh, approximately an 8% increase uh, in, in our base budget. The remaining amount for retaining uh, Attorney General staff of $300,000 uh, represents a 1% increase in our base. The new items, the information technology change items is a little more complex in that about half of it is one-time money and half of it is an ongoing increase to our base of $1.68 million. That represents a 7% increase. And then the antitrust area, 578,000, that represents a 2.5% increase approximately. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, okay. Um, could you detail again the, the, the um, employee retention dollars, if you would, please? Mr. Smith. Mr. Chair, Representative Nash. So in, in the last biennium, we, we were awarded uh, additional money to help narrow the gap between ourselves and other public law offices. That change item was not fully funded. And so this request is to get the $300,000 that was not funded in the last biennium. Representative Nash. Okay, um, if you would, Mr. Chair, uh, and to testify or move on to the tech upgrades, what they are, what they do, and uh, the the costs that we're we're looking at again. And members, uh, just remember that the, the secretary or the attorney general needs to leave around nine fifteen, nine twenty ish. So, um, if we can shorten the questions and, and move on, but. Representative Nash, I think uh, Mr. Smith, if you want to answer that question. Uh, maybe, maybe Mr. Miller might be better for breaking down the IT requests by by unit. Uh, uh, Mr. Miller, again, this, if you want to identify yourself for the record and uh, <clears throat> proceed with that to answer the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Eric Miller, uh, e-discovery manager at the Attorney General's office. I'll also start my video here. 
Um, the technology proposals, uh, the, the first one is increased uh, capacity subscription-based service for our e-discovery tools, which the Attorney General mentioned. The other three projects are what I would categorize as uh, legacy system upgrades. So these are um, SQL backend databases, which is certainly a technology that still exists today. However, the user interface and uh, programming code is actually built in Microsoft Access. Um, a lot of people don't program in that using VBA code anymore. It's not a, uh, I see a number of heads shaking uh, as a number of members on this uh, committee uh, have technology backgrounds. So you kind of understand the vernacular that I'm using here. Um, the current technology does not blend well with having uh, responsive web uh, integrated applications, mobile devices, really uh, allowing members of the public to engage with our office uh, utilizing technology uh, that, that's currently available. Again, the charities database, the consumer complaint database, and the case management are all internally built uh, systems utilizing Microsoft Access. I would note that uh, you know, I spent the weekend reviewing the Blue Ribbon uh, Council on Information Technology report that was put out in June 2020, of which a few members uh, of this committee are part of. And I was pleased to see that our process for evaluating these products were actually um, utilized, this whole notion of build versus buy. And, you know, 20 years ago, it made sense to build these custom applications in-house. Uh, over time with advances in cybersecurity, uh, technology, privacy, uh, it probably makes more sense now to find a product off the shelf that we can get long-term support for, rely on a vendor to maintain. Um, and so I, I'm really uh, utilizing the framework that uh, was outlined in that Blue Ribbon Council uh, as sort of a guiding principles, if you will, for, for these technology products. Representative Nash, uh, last yep. question. Uh, and I'll be, and yep, I'll be quick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I understand that we will have a briefing on some of the technology stuff afterwards. But, uh, you know, I, I guess to end my time again, uh, the AG has certainly made a lot of headlines lately and uh, seems to be staffed well enough to, to do some of those issues. Uh, I, I will posit again that we need to be looking at ways to uh, tighten a belt, and I certainly understand that uh, you're, you're doing your, your level best and that there are technology acquisition issues that have to be addressed. But again, um, and I, I'm going to beat this drum every day that we see a budget request, Mr. Chair. This is not uh, the land of milk and honey. This is not the same budget that we had at the beginning of the last biennium. And this is something that we have to know that the people of Minnesota are looking at us to get done, which is to be responsible and not just look at every request as something that is vitally important that we have to come up with money for, because the only place that we come up with money is the taxpayer's checkbook. So with that, I'll be done, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next on the, my list is Representative Ruskowski. Welcome to, if you wanna ask your question. You need to unmute yourself, Steve. Representative Skowski, you need to unmute yourself. There he goes. There you go. Go ahead and ask your question, Representative Skowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Did I have the mute off when I was talking to someone here? Oh, I you know you did. Now you, you, okay, I, thank you. I was trying to I thought you were asking a question. I saw your mouth moving and I thought oh. you were asking a question. So no, I was uh I was trying to, it was a business deal on my phone that I was trying to get squared away. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um so thank you, Attorney General Ellis and um Attorney General. Um we uh, we have a constitution that uh, outlines very clearly the powers of government. Article three talks about the separation of powers in articles four, five, and six. Uh talk about those three branches and their responsibilities. One of them in the legislative branch, as you know, is to provide uh, for oversight and, and certainly protection uh, and, and um, be aware of, of the encroachments upon uh, its powers as prescribed in the constitution. Uh, you talked earlier about uh, the governor's executive orders. And uh, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that uh, the uh, separation of powers and whether or not 
uh, Section 12.31 is uh, actually constitutional, is very much in dispute. And uh, that, uh, that court case continues forward and at some place will be, uh, will, will be decided upon. Um, so there's a lot of people that believe uh, that uh, what the governor is, is doing is not according to our constitution. Uh, with that in mind, and one thing you said to me was, was kind of, and I think I heard you or maybe the governor, both of you say it before uh, in the executive branch, uh, saying that the executive uh, orders are law. Um, my question to you is, do you really believe that those executive orders uh, our law when the legislative branch is the branch that is charged with writing laws in our state? Or was that simply a, a, an inaccuracy in your rhetoric? Attorney General. Uh, no, according to uh, Minnesota statutes, which were promulgated by a, the legislature in times of uh, civil emergency, civil unrest, uh, the governor uh, does have the authority to uh, issue executive orders, which must be um, approved within a certain fixed amount of time by the executive council. And that matter has to be put in front of the legislature and the legislature can overturn those uh, if it uh, sees to do so. And so, um, uh, yes, yes, sir, I do believe that the executive orders issued by the governor are factually supported with a, with the, by, by an emergency which this pandemic certainly is. We've had over nearly 400,000 Americans dead, thousands of Minnesotans lost their lives and literally millions have been infected. And um, in fact, now we're seeing greater and more virulent strains. So that is clearly an emergency in my mind. Um, so I think that, I, I think that uh, every court that we've gone in front of has vindicated the governor's authority to issue executive orders, courts of competent jurisdiction in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and of course, we'll see what happens in the next cases. But fact of the matter is, so far, uh, it's very clear that the uh, governor is acting constitutionally. Representative Diskowski. And uh, Representative Diskowski, you talk about the lawsuits. If they, if they come down and they rule opposite, opposite, then we'll have to make changes. And I know Representative Pulowski's committee is looking at all those and going to take deep in, a deep in depth look at all those, those issues on in Chapter 12. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're very aware of Representative Pulowski and his committee's activity. Uh, thank you, uh, Attorney General Ellison. Thank you, sir. Um, so what I what I heard from you is uh, you believe that that's actually those executive orders actually comprise law. Yes. Is that correct? That okay. is One more question, Mr. Chair, if I could. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Attorney General Ellison. Um, the uh, the amount of uh, corruption and ineptitude in our government is well documented. Um, chapter eight directs the activities of your office and you've been very involved in your office in suing businesses throughout our state. Uh, I haven't seen uh, your business or your business, excuse me, uh, your um, agency involved in holding governments accountable when they step outside the law. Uh, can you tell me whether you believe Chapter 8 or your duties include holding uh, state and local units of government accountable when they violate the law? Attorney General Allison. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, Minnesota Statute 8.31 authorizes the state, uh, the state attorney general to carry out enforcement action when it's unfair discriminatory practice in the areas of business, commerce, or trade. I don't think that there's any unit of government that would be exempt if they were engaging in unfair, discriminatory, uh, illegal behavior, if they were involved in the practice of business, commerce, or trade. Uh, uh, but it is our job to represent the state agencies. So you can hardly sue your own client, uh, which is what um, we would be doing if we were to um, sue uh, state units of government. So um, I suppose there is a scenario under if 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 uh, if some if some city was uh, selling some product or service and was defrauding people, uh, I don't see anything in Minnesota law that says we couldn't hold them accountable. But the statute promulgated by the legislature, signed by the governor, many years ago, eight point three one, uh, really contemplates that we protect consumers 
in the area of business, commerce, or trade. So I do thank you for your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the last question I have here, because because the Attorney General has to leave, is uh, uh, Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Attorney General Ellison. And I think getting to that question, um, you know, you brought up the countercyclical nature of your office, and also um, in times like these, public health emergencies, uh, the work that you're doing. I'm interested in when we talk about fraud, if you can talk at all about the work you've been doing to fight medical fraud given and, and fraud um, given we have a COVID-19 crisis and we always see um, additional uh, um, uh, um, threats to consumers, I'd say, when we have times of crisis. If you could speak a little bit about that. Attorney General. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Greenman. Thank you uh, for that question because the truth is we've been extremely busy in this area. Um, you know, the fact is, is that there have been, in, right when the, when the pandemic began, there are a number of, of, of establishments out there that were saying that they had a miracle cure or a miracle test or a miracle this or a miracle that. We uh, engage with them and uh, require that they cease and desist that false and deceitful um, sort of advertising. Uh, the, we then moved on and uh, are, in, are involved in litigation with a number of pharmaceutical companies, all which have COVID implications because if, if you are a type two diabetic and you can't afford your insulin, imagine how much more vulnerable you are with a lethal virus spreading uh, throughout the country. It's much more difficult. So we're, we've been extra diligent in that area as well. Also, the Minnesota Attorney General's Office has a history of working on medical billing uh, and making sure that aggressive uh, strong arm tactics to try to get uh, medical bills, old, old medical bills paid up that at least the institutions abide by proper uh, bill collecting practices. And some of them have not always done that. And then in our role as uh, representatives of the state government, we, uh, we have, and in the area of charities as well, we have been uh, in ongoing di dialogues with hospitals to talk about what, how are you meeting the needs for PPE for employees? How are you meeting the needs of underserved communities, particularly when service needs are so high right now. It's been a very, very busy area for us. And I think, uh, and I thank you for asking the question. Representative Greenman, last question, or is that just a quick one? Yeah, I would just say thank you for that. My sister is a nurse practitioner, and I know that she's been seeing some of that, particularly for her most vulnerable uh, clients in long-term uh, care facilities. So I just really appreciate the work that the Attorney General's doing, office, your whole office is doing to protect Minnesotans. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Representative Greenman. And, and Attorney General Ellison, thank you for showing up today. And, and I know you have to leave to get to another meeting. Thank you for your time. And I'm sorry for the members that we weren't able to get to everybody's questions, but um, hopefully when at a later date, if we have um, specific issues before us, we can get other questions asked, or you can submit your questions to the Attorney General's office. But thank you, Attorney General. Mr. Um, Chairman, may, may I just say thank you to you and uh, uh, Ranking Member Nash and everybody on the committee. And if anyone still wants to ask me a question, I'm very accessible. You can even call me and I'll be more than happy to talk about it. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And and members, now we're, wait, the, the, we're waiting for the uh, Secretary of State is supposed to be coming. and. Uh, supposed to be here at 9.30, so let's take a short recess, and uh, we will, when the, the Secretary of State gets here, we can proceed with his, uh, his presentation and his budget requests and, and answer questions.